Kodav Shi'ur is bringing this idea of text-based discourse. Every Shi'ur video that we've been doing introduces this practice as a practice. So our goal is not necessarily to um, introduce knowledge as much as to engage in the act of text-based discourse. Um, also, when it comes to Hanukkah, you can find elsewhere details about the history of Hanukkah and the practices and rituals of Hanukkah. We're going to focus on the themes that lay behind Hanukkah. And we're going to focus on two specific themes. This idea of light, light and darkness, and the idea of rededication. And those, of course, introduce many other concepts too. We're going to look through a variety of texts that are taken out of context and introduced into a new context. Really, every text sits in a context. And context with text, um, we're going to be engaging. Uh, texts that come from classical Jewish sources, some well-known, some lesser known, as well as texts that come from other sources. Hi, Doron. Thank you for joining us. Maybe you can tell us about yourself, your relationship to Shi'ur, um, and also the uh, work of art that you've contributed for Shi'ur 1700. Yeah. Um, well, hello, Mickey. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be at Shi'ur again. I feel like I was at one of the really early Shi'urs that we did. We did a Hanukkah a few years ago and then the ID Festival. Um, so it's nice to be back at Shi'ur. Um, yeah, my name is Daron Sajay. I'm a sound and light artist, uh, originally from Los Angeles, just like you. Uh, and I'm currently based in Berlin. 
And yeah, my work deals a lot with kind of our experience of light, sound, and space. Uh, so a lot about perception and the physicality of these, our experience of these mediums. Uh, so I'm very fascinated with vibrations and what it does to our minds. I'm setting up a kind of performance installation uh, using a laser system that I brought in today. It's a piece that I've been working on for a while. It's kind of still a work in process but I'm modifying it for the kind of space that we have here uh, at Silent Green. And it's kind of about this translation from sound into light. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm directly uh, controlling a high-powered laser system with, uh, with sound frequencies. And so can create shapes, images, and things like that that are actually just a one-to-one -one translation from sound. Uh, and yeah, there's a real intensity to the laser. It has this very like, super kind of digital quality to it, but it's very organic at the same time uh, and can be overwhelmingly bright uh, and, and dangerous, actually. And I'm very much aligned with uh, the themes of Hanukkah and, uh, and light. So I'm going to invite you to read some quotes and we'll discuss them. Yeah. The first one is from Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus, which um, I believe he wrote when he was in L.A., and uh, yeah, please, go, go ahead. The most splendid color they displayed, a dreamlike lovely azure, was, so Jonathan instructed us, no true color at all, but produced by fine little furrows and other surface configurations of the scales on their wings, a miniature construction resulting from artificial refraction of the light rays and exclusion of most of them so that only the purest blue light reached the eyes. Just think, I can still hear Frau Leverkun say, so, it is all a cheat? Do you call the blue sky a cheat? Answered her husband, looking up at her. You cannot tell me the pigment it comes from. So what does this text uh, mean to you? So, I mean, a few things. I mean, one of the things that I like about this text uh, is kind of, I guess one of, the, one of the reasons I'm often really interested, well, in light, but also sound, is how it defines our reality. And uh, especially light, it's this very ephemeral thing. It doesn't, it's not tangible. It's not something you can really hold on to. But still it exists and you can't really question it. And it, it really just defines our whole experience of the world. I like this idea of thinking about this as a cheat because like, right, you have these refraction of rays and all these things to give the, the like, experience of blue light even though there's no pigment there. Uh, so in a way, it's uh, not that it's smoke and, mirror, smoke and mirrors, but it's like that this reality is, is kind of undefined and, and vague and, and, yeah, ephemeral. I think that's one of the challenges that we have is sometimes we naively feel cheated, but we're the fools for, fe for feeling cheated because this is the very nature of being is, is constantly mediated through the filters that we see our world. And I think um, this is very much uh, connected to the theme of Hanukkah. Um, and how, we, how it is precisely through the light that we mediate our world that we determine what world we see and whether we're subject to um, a naive, limited attitude that sees itself as, uh, as having to correspond to a set of fixed rules, which, they, they, which are themselves a cultural product or a human product, or, or whether we can um, step out of that and see the world in an utterly new and different way. Um, the next text comes from the Italian rabbi, playwright, poet, and mystic, Rab Moshe Chaim Lutzato, who um, was from Padova, but spent time, he traveled through um, out Europe. Um, he went through Frankfurt, through Amsterdam, um, eventually made his way to Israel. And he likens knowledge to a live coal that could burst forth into a flame, should we choose to engage. And this is, um, I'm going to invite you to read the next text that comes from his book, Derech Etz Chaim. When you behold a burning coal which is not yet inflamed, but retains its flame concealed and enclosed within it, when one blows on it, it spreads and burns, and goes and bursts out broadly. Within the flame, different shades of color, which could not previously have been seen, appear. They all originate from the live coal. Thank you. What do you see here? Yeah, well, right, there's this idea of, of knowledge being like fire, right? Like being, being this flame uh, or being light. And 
I love that you have this thing, it's coal, which is also like, I don't know, sometimes seen as like a, a worthless object. But through this act of blowing on it, putting breath on it, uh, it kind of, it bursts into flames and reveals this whole kind of universe within it. Uh, complexity of colors and shapes and, and all these things. And fire, you know, this is talking about fire, which I think is also has this life force behind it. Fire is different than these kind of LED lights around us where it really, it, it lives and it moves and it's all kind of contained within this, you know, black object of, of kind of nothingness. Yeah, I think also it, it shifts reality to the subjective that it, we are that coal and how we interact determine, determines what flame and the, the diversity and richness of that flame. And I can't help but think of your light art because that's, that's exactly what you're doing is you're creating from, from the coal of your mind um, or the coal of your devices uh, a whole realm that is inconceivable without your involvement. Absolutely, I mean, it's the thing that I, I find really exciting about making work is kind of just opening up this coal and kind of seeing what it reveals. And the artistic process is often, you know, blowing on the coal, seeing what colors come out, and then figuring out how to sculpt them and kind of offer them to the audience. So the audience also has that experience of the colors and the lights and the knowledge. Yeah, I like it. It gives kind of like agency to that experience of discovery. Exactly. And it's interesting, in, in uh, Kabbalistic language, the intellect is described as light, the light of the intellect, or hasteichel. And it's interesting how um, we shift away from trying to discover or uncover a world and instead focus on cultivating a way of seeing the world. The light of Hanukkah is an artificial light. It's a light that we make. Right. We're not dependent on nature for that light. It's a, it, it comes from um, the friction of fire. And I think it's something really inspiring there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's different. It is very different that it is a coal and that it's fire versus just light in general, the sun, right? God created light to give form to the universe to sort of reveal everything to everybody. But this is different because it gives us agency to be like, well, we need to blow on it. There's like an action required in order to like give us that experience and that enlightenment and that intellect. Yes. Thank you, Doron. Yeah. We look forward to seeing your work. Of course, yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome.
I'm very happy to have uh, my friend and uh, collaborator, Benjamin. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I've um, been in Berlin for so long already. I cannot remember when I came, but uh, I remember when you came. And uh, that uh, changed the city in a way, so I'm very happy to uh, take part of it, of Shio. Yeah, and I come actually from uh, Israel, but from the second Israel, the ultra-Orthodox Israel. So it's uh, Bnei Brak, that's the, the holy city Bnei Brak, that's where I was born. Um, and grew up in a Haredi world. Uh, my father is a uh, Hasid rabbi. And yeah, and I think this uh, Yeride is always Letzore Chalie. And this is all about Hanukkah. Yeride Letzore Chalie. Thank you. I'll translate a little bit of what you just said. Um, so Benjamin comes from an ultra Orthodox family, um, from a rabbinic family, um, with a very well-known genealogy, as we say in Yiddish, Eichus. And Benjamin is also uh, dealing with themes related to his past, but in a very contemporary way through his photography and video art. And we're really lucky to have um, some of Benjamin's work premiere in our video. We're going to look now at a text, a very controversial text, from a transgressive kind of um, rebel movement that existed in the 17th and 18th century, known as the Sabbateans. And this comes from the Sabbatean, I guess he'd be called a heretic, Nehemia Chayun. And he's describing a radical attitude towards a typical Kabbalistic idea, which I'll first introduce these terms before you read it. In the Kabbalistic tradition, there's this idea that there is an outer shell called a klipa, and contained within the shell, within the klipa, is a spark of light. And the classical way to approach this would be that concealed within the darkness of life is a light that is for us to reveal. And we separate ourselves from the darkness and attach ourselves to the light. So I invite you now to read this text um, where he describes a different attitude towards the Klippa. The redemption can be brought about in either one of two ways. Either Israel will have the power to withdraw all sparks of holiness from the Klippa so that the Klippa will either into nothing, will become nothing, or else the Klippa will become so filled with holiness that because of the repletion, it must be sprown forth. Thank you. So what, um, what Chayun is saying here, and this is a translation from Gershom Sholem, who of course was the, a child of Berlin. Um, what he's saying here is that either two ways we can achieve holiness. One way is to with, focus on the light and discard of all the um, discard of all the darkness and all the non-holiness. And the other way is to enter the darkness, to enter the so-called unholy and to sanctify it. To, when everything is normalized or sanctified, then there's nothing left but holiness. And how does, how does this relate to your work, both as a photographer and also um, thematically? Yeah, I think it's um, a very um, strong um, quote. It fits very much uh, my... Uh, biography, coming from so-called the light to darkness, but bringing the spark, the light, into the darkness, and vice versa. I believe this messianic, uh, I'll say, um, text is, um, is what we see in, the, in, our, in today's Yetziah Beshela coming out from ultra-orthodoxy. I'm trying in my work to, to, to go into this gray area. That's my vision, at least, of how things can combine and live peacefully together. 
because like we, the first um, way I think it's it's the war of light and darkness the second on the other side is saying no let's go into the klipa and find in the in the oilomaze in the goisha world in the golus I mean all this significant uh, in Judaism, the, the klipa or the darkness, actually shows us that the darkness is not dark. There is light in the dark because we are living here. We live in Berlin, not in Jerusalem, not in the temple time. And, 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 and we left only with the second way of approaching it. Yeah, I think it's also interesting when it's not even done consciously, like when, when you when you might come here to, in fact, not with that in mind, but you want to be in the klipa. Yeah. And no matter what, you have that pintal yid, you have that, um, that spark yeah. that, that illuminates wherever you are and works with the darkness in a way that somebody else might not. And this leads me to the second quote that I invite you to read, which comes from the great uh, Kabbalistic book, the Zohar. Darkness is black in the Torah. Light is the white in the Torah. I think what's interesting here is we see that the Torah contains both darkness and light. And indeed, in the Jewish tradition, we, we consider darkness to be a form of light almost. It has a, it's not just the absence of light, it has its own value. Yeah, yeah like we, we have this pasuk, uh, we say it every prayer, every mairiv, every day in the prayer. And um, and there is always, it's always a it's question. Yotzer 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 Yotzer. Yeah. So, so it's always, I always ask myself, as a kid, I remember when I saw, when I first learned it, is there is such a thing as darkness? I mean, and I think that's, that's the key here. What do we call darkness? Is darkness exist as, a, as itself, or is darkness is just the lack of light? That, that when you don't have light, you have darkness. I believe that in my uh, work, I show that the darkness is the light, it's just the opposite of it. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing the light from the darkness. And I think that's, that's all about photography. And without this darkness, this uh, camera obscura, this, uh, this um, room of darkness, there will be no light. That's the creation. The creation must start with the darkness. Meaning the darkness is part of the light, it's completely part of it. When half of the world is in dark, the other half is in light. There is no possibility that there will be always darkness in this uh, world. And I think that's the key for this um, quote. And also for my work, it's, it's, uh, it's bounded to my work too. This, finding the light, uh, the, the, the photography. It's like writing with the light. And you write with the light, but what you write with is the darkness. The darkness is the tool to bring you the light. Thank you. I, I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think that it's incredible to see also how the darkness and light is very much situated in how we perceive it, right? Nothing, it doesn't exist as darkness and it doesn't exist as light without us calling it light or calling it dark. And I think that that, that is what you do as a photographer, is you call things out through your medium, that, through your camera, and you uh, are able to offer us a, a radically different way of conceiving our world. And that's what Hanukkah is about. It, Hanukkah is about bringing the light into the darkness. Thank you so much for your uh, lovely contribution, not only your videos, but also your perspectives. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.
Shabbos, 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 Shabbos. I'm happy to have uh, my friend and collaborator, Mirna Funk, with us. Mirna, why don't you tell us about yourself and what you're doing? So what can I say about myself? I am a novelist, I'm a writer, I studied philosophy and history. Uh, I am from Berlin, from East Berlin, and I've been living between Berlin and Tel Aviv for quite some time. Uh, I'm a mother to a cute daughter, she's six. I invite you to read the following quote from the Mashkiach of Lakewood, the former Mashkiach of Lakewood, Rav Nossen Meir Wachtvogel. And this is from a compilation based on his lectures called Sefer Leket Rishimot that I actually received when I was in yeshiva many years ago. So uh, please read it and then we can explore it. Okay. The eight days of Hanukkah were fixed for future generations on account of the victory that was not according to nature. A person in their natural state thinks to themselves, I am in my natural state and wants to continue to behave in comfort and without effort and to combat nothing. It is possible to behave in a way that transcends our natural given state. The victory and miracles of Hanukkah were simple for the one who behaves in a way beyond the accepted natural state. The world treats one according to how they treat the world. Thank you. So what does this text uh, mean to you? It, um, it really speaks to me because I think that currently there is an idea of um, us all being kind of oppressed and uh, incapable of actually living a free world life, a life we want to live. And um, I feel very confused by this notion of, um, of self and of life in general, because I do feel that we have autonomy over our own life and that we are free and, and that we can, yeah, that we can actually cha shape our own life and that being free or acting free or living free does not mean that there is nothing to combat, but of course there is something to combat in order to live your life freely. And, and I don't think that just because we have to, to fight for the things we want, it means that we are not free. Um, it actually, this is what freedom is all about and I really like it. Um, so yeah, I feel, I feel very seen with this text and I'm happy that you chose this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's interesting about Hanukkah, and this is one of the themes that we've been exploring, is it's this idea that, of course, we're going to say, we're going to take things as granted, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, this is how things are. 
And that, of course, reflects an attitude that believes in a fixed essence, yes. a kind of essentialist attitude to the world, yes. and that things are governed by these aspects. And what Hanukkah is about is to recognize that we govern the way the world is perceived by us, mm -hmm. and we shape our world. Mm -hmm. And this line where he says here, the world treats one according to how they treat the world, mm -hmm. I think is incredible. And that's, and that's, I think, the message of Hanukkah that is oftentimes forgotten. This idea that, that um, Hanukkah is not just about like a miracle, but it's about acknowledging that we can transcend the natural state of things. And by natural, we don't mean nature in the sense no, of, of like, you know, flying or going against gravity, but it's how we perceive nature and perceive the world. And this leads us to our next text, mm -hmm. which is coming from Karl Marx. Yeah. It's a short little quote from a contribution to the critique of political economy. Um, I invite you to read this short quote. Yes. It is not man's consciousness that determines the existence, but on the contrary, their social existence that determines their consciousness. Thank you. So at first, this text might seem to be at odds with the text that we read before, because Marx is saying that our consciousness is determined by our social situatedness. Mm -hmm. But is this really in con is it, does this really contrast it? I, I think maybe, particularly if we know Marx, he would say that we transform our social existence. And that but first, when I read it, actually, I absolutely felt that you chose this um, to show something contrary. Co contrary. So I felt when I read this sentence, I immediately thought, okay, this is like something completely different than um, the guy Wachtvogel actually said. Absolutely. At first it seems to be different, but then at a closer look, uh, from both sides, we know that in the Jewish setting, um, it's not a question of just pure consciousness, right? We create a lifestyle, we yes. create a world, yes. and we acknowledge that we are products of that world. That's yes. why we adopt uh, um, practices and rules, and they generate a, a new consciousness. And the same thing for Marx, where his emphasis is how is not in any way um, undermining our ability to transform our consciousness, but it's acknowledging that that comes in parcel with or in part with changing the social setting. And I think the Hanukkah story is very much about this. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, not being determinist or quietist, not accepting uh, the world that is imposed upon us, mm -hmm. but also acknowledging that we can emerge from that. Mm -hmm with a completely new way and not, and not simply um, re reintroduce the very same structures we sought to undermine. Yeah. Thank you very much and uh, I look forward to continuing our collaboration.
Hi, Leon. <laughs> Hi, Mickey. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. What I uh, gave you as a piece for the Shiur 1700 production is a work that I shot in 2015 during the Moscow Biennial. And uh, it was shot in, in Izhevsk, which is a city in Russia. Izhevsk is the birthplace of Peter Tchaikovsky. And I asked the local um, orchestra to live orchestrate a piece of Walt Disney's film Fantasia, which he personally uh, produced. I think he almost went bankrupt when he produced it because it was such a big production. Walt Disney was known as a fierce uh, cold warrior, strong anti-communist, but still he loved uh, Russian classics like uh, Peter Tchaikovsky. When I proposed this work to this orchestra, it became very clear that they were not willing to do it. I think they considered me like acting a bit like an agent, foreign agent or something. It was very weird. So what is left of the work is actually just a recording of how I tried to present it and pro propose it. So this video I now finalized six years later and it became um, a work now, a short video and it deals with different um, ideas of art and the way that they are entangled into a political uh, environment. Coming, me coming from uh, Germany, but I was born in the East, so I'm kind of uh, familiar with the way that, uh, in, for example, in Eastern countries or in socialist countries, uh, art plays a certain role, a very a strong representative role, and uh, so this was for me interesting. So I invite you to read this first text from the Talmud, from Bavli Shabbat 156a. And I'd like to, um, you know, you've selected your video based on our discussions on this text, and I'd be curious to see um, the connections there. Yeah, so it says, Ein mazal Israel, which means Israel is not subject to the constellation, to the constellations, to the constellations of stars. And um, what that means is the, um, what the constellations offer, that's my interpretation, but that's how I see it. What the constellations offer to people is an idea of fate, and which um, somehow um, um, makes life in a certain way determined and it releases people of the idea that they are actually, uh, let's say, how do you say in English, that they are the ones to, to actually build their own life because it's already, you know, determined by the constellations. And um, this is something that um, I think we see often when society becomes very complex, people uh, regress try to find solutions in life and ways that somehow tell them what to do because it's, it becomes too much uh, of an effort to find your way through like a complex uh, and open world. And how it ref reflects to my work is that um, in the GDR, art always had to represent a certain idea of a society. This was already, it was closed, it was already done, it was finished. You know, you see this, like the socialist realism always represents the ideal society. And of course, artists deal in different ways with it, but this was the idea. And this is not a very good um, beginning to make art because art is something that is very open and you have to create and sometimes the outcome is open, like in this work, for example. I tried to propose a work in Russia and um, they didn't allow it. But what actually came out of it is something that exactly describes the conflict that I tried to, that I tried to des describe. And this was interesting to me and so this is how it relates to it. And so the way that art 
the, the, the role that art plays in a political environment is actually uh, reflects very, very strongly to the level of openness of the society. So, yeah. yeah I think I see um, some interesting connections here, particularly in the Hanukkah story, because the Hanukkah story is about a civil war between those that want to see themselves as part and embedded in the Greco, at the time in the Hellenistic society, and those that saw themselves as not subject to that, that wanted to experience a, a mode of consciousness that wasn't confined to the constellations, we might say. Um, and I, I could also see that in, in the case of, uh, of your piece, where instead of having to fulfill a certain, um, a, a certain approved structure, which seems to be the reason why it was rejected, um, your, you attempt to allow art to be liberated from uh, a determinism. And ironically, it's through the, that capturing of the, uh, of the pitch that you create and generate something that was completely unforeseen. And I think there's a wonderful uh, meta aspect to that. The next text that I invite you to read is from Andre Malro. And this was very much, um, this was very much addressing a similar time. This is from 1935. And this was a speech to the International Association of Writers for the Defense of Culture. So it was to a Marxist, uh, to, a, to an audience um, that was aligned with uh, the Soviet um, attitudes then, and uh, I invite you to read this. There is not a single great individual creation which is not enmeshed in the centuries, which does not trail after the slumbering grandeurs of the past. Our inheritance is not handed down, it is one to be achieved. How I um, bring this into in, to, to this context of the uh, Ein Mazal Israel quote, is that we need to know if we say we do not, um, uh, we are not subject to the constellations, we need to know about the constellations. So we need to emancipate from concepts that have a certain role, but we need to understand them. And I think this reflects strongly to the way that, um, at least I say how I learned it, uh, how culture has been created in Judaism, namely by constant emancipation from identity. You always reflect, it's always a reflection, You and by the reflection you start to create, let's say, your own empowering uh, modus operandi, where you take things in your own hand, but you have to understand them. Absolutely. And I, I think the key point here is our inheritance is not handed down. It is something that we achieve. And this achievement is that emancipation. And how else can we be emancipated from unless we, unless we acknowledge what we're embedded in? And this is the power of light, is that light illuminates, it dissolves, um, and it emerges kind of unconfined by, by matter. I think the words of Mauro are very relevant to our times today, as well as this idea of, um, from the Talmud, because it seems that we're, we've returned to an, uh, a realm where there is correct speech, there's correct art, where oftentimes um, uh, creativity is, is not about emancipation from the structures, but rather conforming to the structures. And I'm curious to see if, what your thoughts, if it's, this is not just something that is uh, a relic of, or existing in the East or in the post-Soviet uh, uh, space that you emerged from, or the post-Eastern uh, Bloc space, but it's something that has also emerged in another outfit uh, in the West. What I learned from the East and what I see now again, and it makes a connection, is East Germany was a culture of self-description. So you said, we are. We show solidarity with the people from Vietnam or whatever. It meant nothing. It was these were like hollow words in many times, and it didn't affect any aspect, or like it didn't really affect the way um, that um, the GDR or the people would actually deal with things. So they said we are anti-fascists. The GDR declared themselves anti-fascists 
and it helped them not to deal with the fact that they were also part of Nazi Germany just a couple of years before. They didn't really have to deal with it. And that's very interesting. So there is no moment, there was no real moment of enlightenment. Today, I think we see the same thing. There's a strong, there's a strong dynamic of self-description, you know, like hashtags. And if you describe yourself like this and that, it's, you know, then you decided you are this, but you don't really have to prove it, but it doesn't mean so much. And I'm curious about your thoughts specifically, like, would, is this something unique to your experience in Russia? Or do you think that this, the, this kind of notion of correct art um, is something that exists internationally now? It's part of the zeitgeist that you would also face if you were in the Biennale in Venice or if you were in Art Basel. It is. It is absolutely a, a phenomenon that is not reduced to uh, Russia or, you know, I think it's a very, I think also that this is a very human uh, thing to do, to try to find your way through a complex world. The world is becoming more and more globalized, things are, you know, and people try to create order in all this chaos again. I do not want to say we are living in the second GDR because this is usually a narrative that is more coming from a very strong political right wing sphere. But there are certain ideas of culture, you know, where people try to speed up developments that are very slow. And in the end, if you want to have a political change, you need a cultural change. So this plays a big role, the way that uh, culture is being used uh, or sometimes also abused to deliver a political message plays a very big role more and more. For example, now in the upcoming Documenta, you have much more or you have way less individual positions and you have a lot of um, um, collectives, organizations that are being, uh, that are being part of the Documenta. So there is a strong mix now between politics and culture, and there's also, yeah, and this creates something that I find, if I look at it from a distance, I find it very interesting. If I see it from a point of view where I also see my own involvement, I find it very, very critical and also damaging. And um, yes. So I, it's, I think it's everywhere it's, uh, and it's something that happened in the past and before that and before that, you know, so, um, so we can be very curious how the outcome is. But I also see that by learning from the past, many people see this already. So there are like dynamics that work against it, that say, okay, wait, um, it's not enough to just declare the better word, it's not enough to just like think in utopian ideas because we saw in the past what came out of it. Yeah, thank you for drawing these connections. I, I certainly see um, within the, the Hanukkah tradition, we have a lot to offer in how to mediate between authentic transformation without uh, a sense of reification um, or just uh, reintroducing the very same structures that we sought to undermine. And I appreciate uh, those connections that I hope that uh, we can continue to not be subject to any constellations. Thank you, Leon. Thank you very much. А музыку Ижевскую будут накладывать вот именно на этот фильм? Или нет? Да, мы так не играем. Там разница, там разница будет большая. Там будет большая. Допустим, мы закончим, а там еще будет кусок. Да, да, да. And can you make this Can you make I a can, I could Because I mean, of course, it's not very nice and it's completely different. What do you think? I don't know if this is a problem, actually. It would definitely contribute to a more open world. Hmm. <laughs>
Он не уверен, что это вообще проблема, что вот эта вот ситуация может более интересную работу только создать благодаря вот этим различиям. Это, это постмодернизм. Да. Это дистейший постмодернизм. Ваша задача красиво сыграть. А там они... Ну, все надо смотреть, да, я тоже считаю, что они, да? в принципе, сами решат, что uh-huh. он будет, как Покажут разницу. Быстро в голову, да. Здесь медленно, а где-то быстро. А можно опять все вместе? Да, и ступники. Может быть, в конце концов. Сойдемся, да, в конце концов. Мне кажется, может быть, на самом деле. На самом деле, может быть, интересный момент, когда, допустим, оркестр заканчивает раньше, а в тишине в абсолютной доигрывается какой-то видео еще продолжает играть. Вот это есть какой-то конфликт, есть действительно такая интересная совпадение какое-то с гостовками имеется. Это две цитаты. Вот и увидите конфликт. Мы ищем точки соприкосновения, пытаемся найти. Вот здесь нам не хватило соприкосновения, а здесь было лишнее, да? Почему вот мы... Да, вот все parts missing, for example. It's not the whole number. Просто каждый номер можно начинать вместе, да? Ну, это не полный, даже еще кончик некоторых частей нет. He took out some... Ну, конечно, вопрос интересно, как-то они сделали вот этот фильм, для этого музыка, но... Как мы видим, они сделали вот так, как мы играем. I could... If I would have a recording of the Nutcracker from this orchestra, I could ma- take the film and fit the single parts to the exact ta- timing of the orchestra. Mm-hmm. This could also be very interesting. Part of Shi'ur is bringing this idea of text-based discourse. Every Shi'ur video that we've been doing introduces this practice as a practice. So our goal is not necessarily to um, introduce knowledge as much as to engage in the act of text-based discourse. Um, Also, when it comes to Hanukkah, you can find elsewhere details about the history of Hanukkah and the practices and rituals of Hanukkah. We're going to focus on the themes that lay behind Hanukkah. And we're going to focus on two specific themes. This idea of light, light and darkness, and the idea of rededication. And those, of course, introduce many other concepts too. We're going to look through a variety of texts that are taken out of context and introduced into a new context. Really, every text sits in a context. And context with text, um, we're going to be engaging uh, texts that come from classical Jewish sources, some well-known, some lesser known, as well as texts that come from other sources. We'll start with this text from the Rolling Stone interview, October 4th, 1979, with Susan Sontag. I invite Mirna to read it. Yep, thank you. I really believe in history, and that's something people don't believe in anymore. I know that what we do and think is a historical creation. I have very few beliefs, but this is certainly a real belief, that most everything we think of as natural is historical and has roots. Specifically, in the late 18th and early 19th century, the so-called romantic revolutionary period, and we are essentially still dealing with expectations and feelings that were formulated at that time, like ideas about happiness, individuality, radical social change and pleasure. We were given a vocabulary that came into existence at a particular historical moment. We're talking about processes, not just objects. It's really the nature of our situation to be extremely complicated. And you have to keep directing your attention to what is contradictory and try to sort these things out. Try to purify them. Thank you. So we see here, there's a lot in this text, and a, a lot of the themes here are very much connected to uh, a lot of the language of Hanukkah, interestingly enough, although uh, she didn't intend it that way. I think um, there's two points I want to highlight here. One is this idea of directing your attention to what is contradictory. Mm-hmm. 
the whole idea of Hanukkah, of light and darkness, of the um, of encountering and engaging Hellenism, of not accepting nature, quote unquote, nature as it is, but introducing light. The sun might set, but that doesn't mean we have to live in darkness. It's a very anti-quietude attitude, anti-deterministic, um, and it's one that still acknowledges that we emerge from history and that these historical structures shape and give us a vocabulary to how we resort to looking at the world. And I think this idea of purifying them is a very interesting idea. What do you think about the text? Um, well, I, I chose to read it because I like the first sentence, because this is what I would say all the time. I really believe in history. It emphasizes the fact that we are historically human beings, you know. Um, and I think it's important to understand that we are, because I think that by understanding that we are historical human beings, it just, it, it helps us to see our own life at the same time as something that can be shaped and changed. I was also attracted to the first sentence. Ah, why? But in a way, almost from the opposite. I remember, like I'm from Los Angeles, really close to where Mickey's from actually. And when I left Los Angeles and moved to New York, I started to like have this sense of like an appreciation for Los Angeles kind of rejecting history. It being this place that just like, okay, this is our history, let's just bulldoze it down, build something new. They kind of like to not contextualize your actions through history. And I, it's something I really appreciated about LA, but as I've left LA for so long, and now I've gotten older, I've started teaching, and then this idea of history and building context around what we're doing has, it's shifted for me and I've become really interested in history, Jewish history, this kind of stuff being in Europe, but also like history around artwork that I'm, I'm interested in and this kind of stuff. And that it gives, there's something like kind of uh, reaffirming and knowing the struggles that other people have gone through that are almost the same at various points in history, that it's all, it's all this like cycle of experience and that we have something to relate to. So yeah, it's something that I, I used to hate history, and now it's something that, at least for me, I, I find really fascinating. And it's only in the last few years of being in Berlin. It's also, a, this place has a heavy history, so it's also not yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I know like growing up in LA, learning about Grenadierstrasse, which, which today is called Amstadtstrasse here in Berlin. And, uh, and in, in many ways, like what you're saying is very true in that LA was a place that people escaped to, not in order to recreate what they escaped from, but to create something utterly new. And there is a utopian aspect to LA um, that is, you know, it's, a, it's Hollywood, the land of dreams, La La Land. And it's interesting how Berlin um, was, the, was one of the places that people escaped from. And now it's, it's kind of an inversion that people like us are coming to Berlin, uh, maybe chasing after a bit of that historical texture. But <clears throat> Grenadierstrasse is a very good example. My great grandparents actually and my grandfather, he used to grow up in Grenadierstrasse. And the interesting aspect is that you cannot see it today. You cannot see that Grenadierstrasse was the main street of the so-called Jewish ghetto with open borders. It was the center of Eastern Jewish life in Berlin, and there's not any mention about it. It's probably the most boring and uh, unattractive street in all Mitte and center of Berlin, but the, st uh, the history still exists. And I think this is an important aspect of history. It's not necessarily bound to something visual, but it's also about, the, about truth. So for example, if people have a history and the environment that they now live in doesn't accept this history as a truth, this is also, this can be very affecting for these people, like negatively. So in a time where there's a strong rejection of the concept of truth, um, history is actually something that should teach you that acknowledging truth comes through acknowledging history. Best example in Germany, the Shoah, of course, in, young, in the like, younger history, you know. So whenever these concepts of rejecting truth affect the way we look at history, it becomes very clear that there is a level to history that is um, a lot about, not just about something visible, but about something that we experience and accept 
uh, in the way we also then live together in a society. Yeah, I, th I think um, I think these are all valuable points, and it's interesting also to see again that kind of dialectic where it, it, maybe in LA and in Israel, this is the continuity of Grenadierstrasse, and and because this is where the, 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 many of the survivors came to, and many of the values and ideas that existed, let's say, in Berlin in the 20s and the 30s and the, what, that we associate with Berlin are not necessarily located geographically anymore in Berlin. They've evolved, just like how the grandkids of somebody who stayed in Berlin is still that grandchild. Likewise, the grandkids of somebody who was born in LA is still a descendant of Berlin. I mean, this is three years after she wrote, in 1976, she wrote uh, for a book named Portraits of Life of, and Death by Peter Rougeard. She wrote the profess uh, two pages in the and um, and she talks there also in a way about what is truth uh, because the picture he took in the catacumba in Italy and, um, and there is this uh, history aspect and um, and the photography what 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 uh, that is real and bring to life again. Um, um, the time, so to say, and I, I think that um, Susan Sontag did it in the most powerful way. Um, um, the connection uh, with the art, photography, in this case, um, of um, Peter Rougeard, um to history um, and, and truth and, and responsibility, so to say, in in, in the work of art. Um, and uh, yeah, and Hanukkah is of course uh, um, the, the the strongest example in the in our or in Jewish holiday uh, cycle. It's the only holiday that we celebrate, so to say, outside, because the Pirsum Enisa, which literally means. Uh, I don't know, you were maybe... Publification, like, but making public the yeah. miracle. So like we don't have really uh, holidays that we going outside showing them to the world, but Hanukkah is specifically that, like putting the, the, the symbol of Hanukkah outside in your window so that your neighbor or the passer, passager, somebody that's passing in the street will see it and, ah, it's Hanukkah today, okay. So is it's it like... Do you think this is like um, showing that that there is uh, showing to the outside that there is strength? Yeah, but it, most of the holidays are showing. About, I mean, Purim about, is uh, saving, Hanuk, uh, mm -hmm. Pesach is saving. Yes. But this is not just saving; it's also saving and showing out are being saved. Exactly. This is what yeah. I meant. But actually, yeah. I think I think that, that those are both. Interesting, excellent points, but I think, at least according to many of the traditional understandings of Hanukkah, it's not about the salvation of the people. It's about the, the, the nes, the uh, miracle, yeah. is about this idea that um, of the of the oil, the of the light. And I think this is very tied to what we're talking about now, where truth is not some universal. We, everybody has their narrative. Everybody has their truth. The question is, what truth do we hold ourselves to? accountable to. And the idea of Hanukkah is to say that we don't hold ourselves according to the Hellenistic way of life. Our miracle is not the miracle of being saved or a battle. Our miracle is a miracle of light. And that light is a light that transcends history, or at least is organized by another form of history. And I think that's very important. And that's very, uh, and that's very much tied to something that is very relevant today, because we live in a time of competing narratives. We live, we live in, a time, in a time of competing truths. And I don't think anybody can, can say that a truth is not embedded. And this comes back to Sontag. When Sontag is talking about how truth is embedded in history, and the, the struggle is not a struggle of de determining what is the truth, but it's determining our, his, our historical genealogy of what shapes the way we see that truth. And then the next step is another question. We're going to get back to this in a, in a later quote, but let's first 
get into the text here. Um, we're going to look at, this is a text from Reb Tzadok of Lublin. Reb Tzadok uh, was a Hasidic sage who lived in Lublin. He was born in Kurland in uh, Latvia. And he um, came from a non-Hasidic background, a very important Talmudic, uh, Lithuanian style background. And he became a student of the Ishbitzer Rebbe, or a follower of the Ishbitzer, um, who had a very radically subversive form of of uh, Jewish mysticism and Hasidism. And he died in 1900, the same year that Nietzsche died, interestingly. And he explored uh, a, a lot of uh, questions of light and darkness and different ways of conceiving light and darkness. I invite uh, Benjamin to read. We learn from the creation of the world that in everything, the night comes before the day. As the Talmud, Talmud teaches, in uh, Talmud Bavli Brachot 2a, for in everything, absence precedes existence. For all of person's life is such that times is composed as, uh, of darkness and light, day and night. And that cycle repeats itself as a circuit, with the darkness always coming first, as the pill precedes the fruits. For one that has already arrived in, at holiness, the day is first, like w one who is already inside the fruit. From his perspective, the fruit comes before the peel. Thank you. This is a great text here. So the first, we, we, he compares two types of people. There's the, there's the majority, the regular person, that darkness precedes light. Right? Um, so in the classical, for example, uh, Jewish calendar, the calendar day begins in the night. So you would say, for example, that um, like in the Western days, we, in the Western calendar, we would say the, the uh, day begins at 12.01 a.m., right? Like after midnight. But in the Jewish calendar, it would begin the minute the sun sets, it's no longer Shabbat anymore, for example. Um, and it's already considered after Shabbat. Um, and the ho a holiday always begins at night. We bring the holiday in at night. And he see, we, we can take this also psychologically, that in order to get to light, we have to go through a process of experiencing darkness. Because of course, also how else can we see light without understanding darkness? But then he, then he goes further and he says, he uses this lovely example, which is a, a, a oftentimes traditional example. In order to get to the light, right, we have to go through the peel. To, to, in a fruit, you have to go through the peel. You want to get the, you, you want to get the, um, what's inside, you have to go through what's outside. You have to go through the klipa, this, this uh, um, external, externality, this kind of, ins this, this kind of um, impure, dark, insignificant pettiness, right? And it, we have to go through that to get to the light. But then, and this is the important part, then when we transform ourselves, that we are in a state of holiness or sanctity, in a state of light, then it's like we're inside the fruit. And it's the other way around, yeah. And you see, you first see light, and only afterwards you see a bit of the darkness. Now what's the connection to what we're talking about here? Is again, we, we acknowledge the situatedness, that we shape the world that we inhabit. And it's mediated through darkness to get to light. Um, why don't we have our next reader? Why don't uh, Duron read? No. Because the appropriation of metaphors is self-implicating, adopted metaphors can literally create worlds and determine their nature. On this view, religious truths that were first justified instrumentally will eventually be confirmed by their ability to lead us to a level of experience which is recognized beyond that which we have previously known, not only on the existential and subjective level, but even in terms of the infinite possibilities capable of being realized in our external reality. Thank you. This comes from the contemporary Israeli American philosopher Tamar Ross from the cognitive value of religious truth statements. And I think this is very interesting here. So what she's saying here is instead of looking at um, metaphors and language as something that corresponds to a fixed truth or to a fixed reality, these generate a reality. They constitute meaning. 
So language is not something that is referring to a fixed truth or reality. Rather, language generates and constitutes that meaning and feeling. And this fits what we've been talking about, this idea of not being subject to the structures that, let's say, dominate the general world. In the Jewish tradition, we would say like the, the secular world, the constellations that we find ourselves in. And also, of course, not denying that they play a role in shaping where we are right now, but entering a new level of consciousness and being. One that through our own language and including appropriating and transforming things that exist in one way into another way. The fire that can burn and destroy can also be the fire that can illuminate and build. Because this one I think is actually very much tied to what you were talking about. This idea of we build, uh, uh, particularly you, Leon, you know, that you, you construct that that space. You mean with the work that we were talking about? Yeah. yeah, of course. It created, through the restrictions of the creation, there was a new creation. And we don't look at that creation as always corresponding to something that already exists, that that, that creation can introduce a whole new mode of yeah. being. And still everything somehow, and this is, I think, important because I, I agree with this totally, but still when you create, when language creates its own let's say, history or whatever, it still refers also to the other one. So it might still transport in itself what it refers to. It's it, not it, yeah. gone, it's still there somewhere. So it's, I think that's important, you know? Exactly, yeah. That the, it's like a build-up and not so much a replacement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, this is the kind of impossibility of innovation, right? Yeah. We are always limited to the tools that have been created. Otherwise, uh, um, otherwise, I mean, if we, we can't use something that doesn't emerge from yeah. our world. <laughs> okay, why don't you read the next one, Leon? <laughs> <laughs> Light breaks where no sun shines, says Dylan Thomas. <laughs> D does it? This is the quote? That's the quote. I can also go on and uh, read two more short quotes. You can read those two, but let's first just clarify this one. Okay. What can that mean? Light breaks where no sun shines. To me, it means that light and sun are not necessarily the same thing. Exactly. Because sun is in itself makes, but light comes like I, if I can create light as a person, enlighten or whatever, and I don't need the, let's say, energy of the sun or the help of the sun, I have to do it for myself. Maybe something like this could mean. Exactly. I mean, when you light a candle in broad daylight, <laughs> does the candle illuminate? No. Um, and I think the whole idea of Hanukkah is to say we don't depend on the sun. We light the we we, we don't depend on it could be winter. And remember, Hanukkah is during winter, at the and during the darkest time of the year. And instead of being depressed and accepting a, this darkness as how things are, we create our own light. So yeah. the point is, on Hanukkah, we light candles every winter, and we illuminate our life. We're not dependent on the sun for light. We're not dependent, it can get dark at 4 p.m. and we're not going to sit in the dark. There's a reason why this holiday comes in the middle of winter. Because we don't accept winter. Because we manage to, to create fire and, exactly. and become independent from nature. Exactly. And that's the point, is that we constitute our own light. Yeah. yeah I think it's a natural uh, human uh, um, search to to win the the darkness uh, in all cultures we have this uh, same yeah I mean it, look at the concept. date of Hanukkah is the 25th of Kislev what's the date of Christmas 25th of December I mean there's certainly a, a, a lot of uh, similarities here um, and I think the point though is not only we see this on a on a more on a manifest level like we said about the, these holidays of lights it's again with Christmas and with Hanukkah but we also see the psychological effect of this, that it trains us to um, acknowledge that we play a role in illuminating our life. And I'm curious for you as the light artist. Yeah, I mean, well, <clears throat> what I, I mean, what I take out of this quote also is this word breaks, because it, to me that re like requires some kind of fissure or some kind of action. Uh, so it's, it's very active, whereas sunshining is very passive. 
And so the, the idea of Hanukkah is also, right, it is, it is very active. It's like whatever, they save the temple and they lit the candles uh, the, or they lit the oil, but it's very much like an act, and it's an act that you have to, to put upon the world in order to cause change. Um, Beautiful, that actually fits like, it's a perfect segue to the next uh, quote. Leon, you can read that one. Apprehension through prophecy is of darkness, through scholarly thought is of light. From Reb Sadok again. So this is, so let's take a, a moment here. So Reb Sadok is comparing the idea of a prophet to the idea of a scholar. A prophet is somebody who receives without any um, skill of their own, right? Medium. Like a medium, exactly. They're a conduit. A prophet sees, like you say, a seer. They have the capability to see. But that doesn't necessarily involve their own mind or their intellectual labor or their own genius. They simply receive. And Reb Sadok says that somebody who apprehends um, something through prophecy is dark. It's like they're in a state of darkness because they depend on something else for that light. Whereas somebody who apprehends through scholarly thought, through intellectual discourse, mm. through their own mind, this is light. And this is exactly like what, what both of you were talking about, this idea of, of being active. Of being active and it's through the friction. And again, if you want to go back to the idea of fire, right? How does fire come? Fire comes through friction. That's what generates those flames. And this goes so far, this idea goes so far in the Jewish tradition that in the Talmud, we have the following quote from a Memar. Uh, Leon, you can read that again. Uh, a scholar is preferable to a prophet. This is from the Babylonian Talmud, Bava Batra 12a. And this is a really radical idea <laughs> that says a Chacham, a scholar, is on a higher level, is preferable to a Navi, to a prophet. It's a bit of a punch, I'm thinking now, to the ultra-Orthodox kind of thought. I mean, they read it, but um, I, we always uh, learn, like, also from the quote before, I like thought of the Enlightenment, 19th century, 18th century, the, the, all the scholars that uh, brought us to modern time. and. Um, and how uh, ultra-orthodoxy is so against it uh, and see it in a, such a dark shadow of, or, or, or in such a um, scared of it, scares of it and um, sees it as a, um, as a threat. A threat, yeah, for Jewish uh, life, life mm -hmm. today. And, and, uh, and, uh, and we prove here that it's just the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it depends certainly on the circles that you're in. I mean, within the, within the ultra-Orthodox world, there's also an incredible realm that places great, great emphasis and respect for the scholastic yeah. idea. Like, they're not necessarily um, going around and meditating all day to achieve enlightenment. They're, they're very much engaging in discourse. Um, I, but... I have yeah. to... One thing, I have to think when I see this and... I have to also think about this, um, let's say, movement of the cultural pessimists of the late 19th century in Germany who saw their identity threatened by culture. So they thought by like culture, like creating, emancipating, creating, thinking, da da da. They thought this will destroy our identity or it will break it into fractions and pieces and in the end we will not know who we are anymore. We will lose ourselves in all these mind games and creations Openness. and so on. And, and the move that they did then was a very um, regressive move from modernity into nature as a symbol of the opposite of modernity. Paganism. Paganism, yes, paganism. So I, it's really, I think in the Jewish context, it's really interesting because, you ha because both is very, very strongly existing. This, what you said, the orthodox, like people who are also f afraid of mm. these kind of cultural dynamics. Right. And on the other hand, a very, very strong dynamic that appreciates it a lot. 
somehow it created it, it created and, cre and even created it. Like so, I think. Yeah. And maybe it's important that these uh, two Poles, movements, yeah. uh, opposing movements, exist because maybe this this friction um, creates the activity, especially from the more like schooler movement. Maybe they they need this other in order to because maybe they will think one day oh, it's done like I don't know but, but I, I feel like there needs to be a friction mm. for moving forward you know I think from this friction also comes art Every, yes we are trying to get out from things from the gray area I mean we create from this black and white or darkness and light and then uh, something comes out yeah some color, some gray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think also uh, these are not absolutes, right? For you, you might see something as a very conservative space, and for somebody else, that very that what, what, what to them is deeply conservative is subversive. Yeah. And we, um, and that's part of this idea of a, of the role of subjectivity, of, of, of you know where you stand is certainly going to change, it affect how you see, and how and also where you stand and how you interpret that thing. So it's interesting too, how we have um, in Berlin, I think, uh, and in, we have both people like yourself that, that leave um, and other people that in Berlin get closer and they adopt the very same things that you reject. And to them, they might, in their adoption, that's the, that could be literally in the same way of you adopting the, the non-Orthodox lifestyle. Yeah, and we meet in the I middle. Did it, it's also, there was now like a, a a very superficial this, uh, discussion about the halakha, in, of course, in the German media. So there's not much knowledge about it, but it was pretty clear to everyone. Halakha is something um, that is um, very conservative, excluding and so on. But actually, if you s look at the halakha from its history and so on, it can also be the exact opposite. It's not bound to zeitgeist. It's to, it's actually to have something against zeitgeist and from different times different perspectives it can also be something that is protecting very um, modern ideas namely accepting a law that makes everyone the same under the law against very identitarian movements and now from a different perspective it's being considered as, as something um, conservative which i completely disagree with because it's neither nor. It's yeah, it it's, depends. It's yeah. something mm -hmm. that should leave these uh, categories behind or not let them come in. I think you. I think you bring up an excellent point. Um, what, and which I think is it's, it's funny again, like exactly what our theme is. It, the thing is, is that we assume that there is this notion of eight zeitgeist. It's so presumptuous to say that what you conceive as the norm is somehow a universal, like the zeitgeist. It's kind of like that group of cool kids that think that their internal uh, slang is universally accepted and universally true and that they can impose that on the rest of the world. And what we're saying is we're not denying the, that we, we, play, we play that game, right? We all, we all have our own halakha. Halakha comes from the word um, to walk. We have our own path, way of walking. And, way, and, and, and it's important to see the dynamism in halakha. The only difference is that one group pretends that it's nature, that this is how things are, and the other group says, no, the way you conceive of nature is also shaped by your historical situation and the way that you see things. And that's the, that's the revolutionary nature of halakha, and this is the argument against this kind of neo-paganist idea that says that we just somehow are these pure, innocent, creatures and nature is this fixed beautiful thing that we have to stand in awe of and it doesn't acknowledge that even the way that you perceive nature is going to be shaped by your upbringing and by your culture okay now me right yeah so the Zohar explains the difference between a cistern in Hebrew bor which has no water of its own and the well in Hebrew be'er with its own running and living waters. The bore has to be filled from without. The be'er replenishes 
itself, while on high the soul enjoys the good, but only in the category of the boar. But once the soul has descended to earth and has made the good her own by engaging in the struggle provided by bodily life in the material universe, the good she has acquired makes her category that of the well of living waters, the bear that requires no other for its existence and refreshing powers. Thank you. This comes from the introduction of uh, Rav Arya Leib Heller to the Shev Shmatata. Um, and this is a translation from, or an interpretation from Louis Jacobs. And he, he, the, uh, the uh, author is addressing a Kabbalistic idea, a well-known Jewish idea that is, that is aligned with our discussion of the prophet versus the sage, or that we can also say the sun versus the fire, where you have a cistern, which is like a, um, I guess it would be the equivalent of like a, um, a, a pit that is, a, a pit that has no, that is kind of, so it's solid, right? So whatever water is in that pit has to be poured into it. So it would be like a bowl or like a jar or, like, um, or a pit um, that whatever water it has comes from outside. It doesn't generate its own water. This is compared to a spring, to a well, a bear where the water is generated on its own. So the question is asked, why, why were we created in a way that we have to go through all this work? Why are we created in the status of a be'er, of a well, instead of, instead of um, just being given everything, right? Mm. Like why suffer? Why go through all this? So what the Shev Shmaitza is saying here, what the, what the author is saying here, is that when the soul, according to this tradition, is on high, because if, if, according to this tradition, the soul comes down to earth and it comes from heaven, right? So the question is that, if you're already in heaven, why come down to earth? Why not, be, why not come to earth like perfectly? And what he's saying is, is that the, by coming to earth and by dealing with the material encounters, by the bodily issues, by, by going through the halakha, of how we encounter and refine ourselves and we encounter ourselves in this world and we refine ourselves in this world, this, trans that, this brings us to the category of a be'er, of a spring, of a well that is self-generating, self-sustaining. And this is an interesting thing, I think, to address in our society today. Because a lot of the discourse today is about introducing correct ways of speaking, correct ways of seeing the world. And oftentimes this can lead to people behaving in a way that might be aligning, aligned with very good things. But unless it's achieved through a self-generating, a, um, a, a way that comes from itself and from its own encounters with the world, it will not be sustainable. And, I, and I, I'd like to, I think in this case, it's interesting to hear um, your, both of your experiences coming from the former East Germany there, where there, there was this idea of, um, no, there was no space for dissent. Everybody had to believe in what's correct. And interestingly enough, of course, we probably all agree with this idea that being a Nazi was bad, and, and, and we, we would, none of us would love to hear Nazis speak in the 1950s and 60s. But you had this strange situation where in West Germany, the Nazis were much more vocal and more present. But today, in the former East, we have a bigger problem of neo-Nazis. And I'm curious if you see a kind of similarity here, where there's, in one case, it's like East Germany was this category of the cistern, of the boar, where, you're, where all the anti-Nazism, all the anti-fascism is being poured in from outside. And they didn't have to go through that struggle because they were not given the space to do that. Whereas in West Germany, they were given the space to organize to be, to be present, but then they had to go through their own struggle, and there was a struggle between fascists and anti-fascists, very public, in a very public way in the West. I'm curious about your thoughts. My comment would be two comments. Yeah. One is the language thing. Uh, because people, you said it, were supposed to think always the same thing. The problem was that there was a language that you had to speak, uh, a language that's, that signalized that you are 
part and, of a certain system and an idea and that you are committed to it. For example, when I see letters of my, grand, of my grandfather who was a journalist, when he was writing to comrades, it's a joke. If I read it, this language is so ideological. But you had to write like this. My dear comrade, blah, comrade, blah, 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 all these like codes, you know? So the language was full of codes and buzzwords. And I said it before, it was a language of self describe, of describing yourself. You were signalizing that you are part of this. And this was also allowing you to be part of the whole thing. The other thing was the foreigners, they were foreigners, but uh, they were called so so called, uh, they were called contract workers, or they were contract workers from Mozambique, from Vietnam, yeah. but they lived basically in closed communities and contact to Germans was very restricted. And actually, for a country that uh, called itself a country that is very, it shows a lot of solidarity, that is anti-fascist, that is like internationalist and uh, in favor of um, uh, Volksverständigung uh, or whatever they called yeah. it, in these, you know, like all these, this language, they were very, very close to the identitarian idea of ethno-pluralist societies. It's a societies where you are friends to each other, you know each other, you maybe accept each other, let's say that is different levels, but you, everyone for themselves. Mm -hmm. The different people of the world stay within their own collectives and like this we can have peace, peace between the people. And this is of course something that doesn't help you to experience anything. And the same counts, with, uh, uh, counts or is also uh, true for language. If your language is closed, if you are uh, more and more um, dependent on buzzwords, there will not be the exchange anymore. I think, it, I think it's uh, interesting in the sense of that maybe we can never be completely a, a cistern or a bore, no, even, even if we're treated that way. We eventually are forced to become that well, that better. I think uh, your turn, Doron. In fact, the internal obstacles seem almost greater than external difficulties. For even though the question where from presents no problems, the question where to is a rich source of confusion. Not only has universal anarchy broken out among the reformers, but also every individual must admit to himself that he has no precise idea about what ought to happen. However, this very defect turns to the advantage of the new movement, for it means that we do not anticipate the world with our dogmas, but instead attempt to discover the new world through the critique of the old. Our program must be the reform of consciousness, not through dogmas, but analyzing mystical consciousness obscure to itself, whether it appears in religious or political form, it will then become plain that the world has long since dreamed of something of which it needs only to become conscious to possess it in reality. It will then become plain that our task is not to draw a sharp mental line between past and future, but to complete the thought of the past. Lastly, it will become plain that mankind will not begin any new work, but will consciously bring about the completion of its old work. Thank you. This comes from a letter of Karl Marx to Arnold Ruge in September 1843. So I think you're, the first thing that, uh, that is interesting is this idea that it is precisely in, by, in those moments of darkness where we don't see the light coming, where we're not capable of expectation because we're just thrown out. We don't see things anymore in a way that we thought, that we thought things were organized by. The whole structure seems broken it's precisely then that we ought to be most optimistic. Because that means we're in the beginning of something new, of something radically new. And the program must be the reform of consciousness, not through dogmas. And that's again, we talked about the role of history, of when history oftentimes becomes dogmatic, when these labels, these definitions become strict rules to mediate life. We have to relax them, we have to soften them. And only then are we capable of seeing something in a different way. And he uses this term where consciousness becomes obscure to itself. And this oftentimes happens where, we, where what we think is a sense of self that might be aligned with an attitude, that we think is aligned with an attitude. We realize 
that just because it describes itself that way, just like you were talking about, Leon, just because it describes itself that way doesn't mean it necessarily does align to what it describes itself to be. And it's very hard to acknowledge that rupture. And Hanukkah is precisely about this kind of blinding light, a light that dissolves the dogmas and structures of the past. And it, what it illuminates is not evident yet. Come to my mind that in Hanukkah, every Hanukkah, we read uh, Parashat Vayeshev, which uh, talks about uh, uh, Yosef being thrown to the pit. And um, there is a very famous um, quote uh, from the explanation of the Pasuk. There is, it says on the, in the Torah, he was thrown and this pit was empty. And, uh, and this emptiness that this pit had, it's like there is no water, uh, but there was nachashim ve'akrabim yesh. That's like Rashi says there on the spot. Like, but that's there were uh, snakes and scorpions. Yeah, yeah. But that's 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 very much like um, the idea of this uh, of the pit on the darkness and the person that is thrown to this darkness. And uh, maybe it's connected because it's always Hanukkah. Every Hanukkah, that's the that's the story we we, we tell the person that was thrown to the most deepest darkness and became the... It's like Cinderella picture, uh, story, yeah. And, uh, and that's Hanukkah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, he rose to the heights through the darkness. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mirna, why don't you read this quote from Emma Goldman? The history of human growth and development is at the same time the history of the terrible struggle of every new idea heralding the approach of a brighter dawn. It is tenacious, hold on tradition. The old has never hesitated to make us make use of the foulest and cruelest means to stay the advent of the new. In whatever form or period the latter might have asserted itself, nor need we retrace our steps into the distant past to realize the enormity of opposition, difficulties and hardship placed in the path of every progressive idea. Thank you. This comes from Emma Goldman in her famous essay of 1910, Anarchism, what it really stands for. And what she's saying here is that history is always present in pulling us down, in keeping us from going forward. Very similar to the text we read from, from Marx about um, the dogmas of the past that kind of shape our and limit our sense of consciousness. And the challenge is to acknowledge that, not to forget that, but also to move beyond that, into that space of undefined.
So we're going to conclude with um, our last quote. Uh, Leon, why don't you read this one? When a, coal, uh, when a coal does not come alight, poke it and it will shine. Thank you. It's from the Zohar. Yeah. So this is probably one of my favorite um, quotes and texts um, from the Zohar. It's this idea that if you look at a coal or an ember, um, or a piece of wood that, uh, that should be a flame, and you look at it and there's no flame coming out, give it a poke and then the flame will come. And I think this goes very much, um, this is very aligned with our whole discussion of Hanukkah, which is saying that we do need to fight history to a certain extent. We need to fight winter. But that struggle is not a struggle that ought to, um, that, that ought to reintroduce the very same structure that we seek to emerge from. Otherwise, what's the point? And it's only through that action that the flame, can, the illumination can happen. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in darkness. I want to thank all our participants here for joining our conversation and also for um, their contributions to the video. I think that we live in a time that there's so much out there <laughs> that just needs to be poked um, if we want to see that flame. Otherwise, if we take things as they are, we'll just be stuck in a darkness that maybe we don't want. Thank you all. Wishing everybody here and all our viewers a happy Hanukkah. And everybody's invited to continue and join us in our conversation in Shi'ur. We meet every Wednesday on Zoom and we do live events. You can find us at Shi'ur International on Instagram. Uh, all our details are there. Everybody's welcome to continue the conversation. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs>